We have three gospel readings. Please all stand in honor of God's word. The first reading is taken from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The second reading is from 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And the last reading is from the book of Joshua, chapter 1, verse 8. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Good morning, church. I think that sounds better. It's great to be here this morning to share a few of my thoughts with you. And uh, it's nice to see Pastor Apu here back with us. It's... Uh, a great church to be here, and it's so good to hear the praises to whom we all, every Sunday or Friday morning, assemble and bring glory and honor to. We have a great God, and I really find this is a great privilege to be here in this church, to be able to sing those lovely songs in honor of our God, and today... Well, our pastor had to preach in SAR fellowship and uh, somebody else had to be here. But since that somebody else is not here, I'm here. So you'll have to listen to me. Let's ask the Lord for his leading. Almighty God, our loving and living Father, we want to thank you and praise you, Lord, for what a mighty God you are. And Lord, for this beautiful morning that you've given to us. And even, even as we spend a few moments dwelling on your word at this moment, Lord, I seek your leading and unworthy as I am, O oh Lord, you have chosen me to speak here today. And I pray that my thoughts and my words will be only those that are acceptable to you and only those that would be edifying to all of us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Bertrand Russell, the great philosopher of the 20th century, once said, while talking in an interview to somebody, something that shocked him. He said, there on the Bible, on that shelf is the Bible. I place it near Voltaire. Antidote and poison. He used the words poison and antidote. Poison to mean the Bible and the book of Voltaire to mean the antidote. The French writer Voltaire, who is known for his free thinking, was so great in the sight of Bertrand Russell that he felt that that was an antidote to the poison, which was Bible. That's the type of scholarship that we see. Richard Dawkins, whom some of you must be very familiar with, who has become very famous in the last decade, who some people call as the missionary of atheism, or a missionary for atheism, speaks such strong words against, against those who believe in God that he goes on to write a whole book calling it the God delusion. Believing in God is a delusion according to Richard Dawkins, a great evolutionary biologist from Britain. What do we talk about these people so learned, so knowledgeable, winning so many accolades, writing books, and talking about Bible and about Christianity like this and about people who believe in God. But then we know that this is not something new. 
People have not been believing in God, just not now, but for years. There has been, must have been people who met David, which is why he said, the fool has said in his heart that there is no God. In Psalm we hear David saying very clearly that yes, the fool has said in his heart that there is no God. So the fact that people do not believe in God is not something new. It's been there for years. There have been people who never believed in God, never believed in the Bible, never believed in the word. But what we see here is the need for many of us today, believers who want to be politically correct who want to be able to mix in with what is around us so that we try to dilute the message of the gospel. I think that's a very sad part. Just a couple of years ago, the famous British Broadcasting Corporation, the BBC, decided to change the way it numbered years. Do you know that? AD and BC, which is what we always know of, before Christ and Anno Domini, but they wanted to call it different. Now they want to call that as BCE, before Common Era and CE common era. They don't want to use the word Christ. It's demeaning. It's not politically correct. That's the sad state of the world today. You have aggressive people asking aggressive questions and which can even stump the great believers like probably Joel Austin who will stumble when Larry King asks him, do you say that Jesus is the only way? Because we are living in a world where we are having an onslaught on Christianity, an onslaught of Bible, which is very hard to rebuke and fight against. So is Bible really the best book to read? I thought that's the reason why we may have to look at a few points here today as believers who must look at why we think that Bible is the best book to read. You see this Bible that we have with 66 books written by 40 people in three different languages from different regions, but still we know that it is divinely inspired because some of us have experienced that this Bible talks about only one person, the person of Christ. We know that this Bible talks about him coming and this Bible talks about him living and this Bible talks about him rising up and living today. One whom we should all believe. And how is it that we know that it is really divinely inspired? Well, even in the times of the New Testament, when Paul was writing to different churches, I'm sure he has encountered people who had doubt in the scriptures, which is why Sister Apple had read to us from 2 Timothy, where it says, all scripture is God-breathed. When Paul writes to Timothy, he says it very clearly, lest some people think that it is not, let me make it very clear to you that all scripture is God-breathed. The King James Version says that all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for teaching and reproof. But here if you read the New International Version, it says all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We see here in this Bible, long time ago people had understood that there are going to be skeptics. Which is why Paul writes that it is breathed by God. He tells Timothy that whatever scriptures you are reading are not by people, but it is by God who had given it. We see also Peter in 2 Peter, 1st chapter 20 and 21. If you see those verses there, very clearly it says, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For... Prophecy never had its origin in human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So the real author, as many might think, is not the people who wrote, but it is God himself. It's breathed by God. And all the prophets were led by God through the Holy Spirit. Now that's what the Bible says. And we are talking about the New Testament because obviously it's Peter Timothy of the New Testament. So there were books of the Old Testament about which they are talking like this. It seems that the scripture has been put together not now many, many years ago. In 180 AD, Melita of Sardis, Melito of Sardis, who was the bishop of Smyrna, was supposed to have first made up that biblical canon of the Old Testament where he put together the books which he thought were real inspiration of God. Because we know a canon is the list of books that any religion or community considers as authoritative scriptures. And those which we do not consider as authoritative scriptures, we call them apocrypha. 
The Roman Catholic Church, for instance, has a few books which the Protestant Church does not accept as being canonical or biblically inspired by God, or, or we can see. So the difference between these two, or how do we understand that these are really the authoritative scriptures? Well, we cannot understand this by reading books. We can understand it by reading the scriptures themselves. And that's the important thing that we need to do. Well, of course, some of us can go and read about how these things have been made into a canon, how these things have been called as inspired by God. What is it that makes them unique from so many writings that are available of that particular time? There were people who have written. By, by the time Jesus lived, there were people who have written great books, Socrates, Aristotle, Plato. They were all there writing different things, Zeno, Heraclitus, but we see that these scriptures have been so fruitful that 2,000 years later we are still reading them. That very fact shows us that these are texts and scriptures that have been inspired by God. Josh McDowell, one of the greatest apologists, says that for him, you know, there are several books he's written on this, but in one of the books he gives several reasons, but I found these three very good. He says the unity of the books themselves makes me believe that they are true. Joshua was a general, he wrote. If you look at the writers only, look at the variety of writers that we had. Joshua was a general, Daniel was a prime minister, Nehemiah was a court servant, Amos was a shepherd, Luke was a physician, Paul was a rabbi, Peter and John were fishermen. Look at the diversity of the people who wrote. But still they are talking about one person. The unity is what makes it amazing. People can have different accounts of what they are hearing. Maybe somebody sees the 9-11 occurring. And everybody gives different, uh, different reports, but that does not mean that event did not happen. What we need to understand that Jesus was here, walked the earth, died that horrible death, and rose again so that today you and I can have the authority to be called as his children. And that's what we need to believe because that's what is important in the Bible. And we see that divine inspiration when you look at all through this. And also you see, if it was somebody who was trying to paint a good picture, they wouldn't have painted the picture of Moses wrong. They would have given the good and bad side of Moses. They would have given the good and bad side of David. They would not have told us that Paul and Barnabas had a silly argument. But yes, the Bible is frank. It's clear. It does not say only the right thing. Only one thing which you think is what people will like. Which is why we see it. And another reason why I think we should believe and what Josh McDowell says is the very fact that Jesus himself believed and quoted the Old Testament several times. When he said, is it not written? Is it not written? Have you not heard? When he keeps talking about the old prophets, what does it say? Jesus himself has accepted that they are authoritative scriptures and which is why we as Christians today must not forget to understand that there is a divine inspiration in this wonderful book that we call Bible. In 1961, it seems they found a small rock which shocked the archaeological world because on it was an inscription which said, Pontius Pilate, Prefect of Judea, in Hebrew, written, and they were surprised because nearly after almost 2,000 years, they find a rock on which there is a clear mention of a name. This particular archaeologist who found this, when he showed it to others, it is today accepted by both biblical, or, biblical archaeologists and those who are opposed to this as an authentic rock on which you can see that Pontius Pilate was really in Judea at that time. In 1993, they found another rock in, uh, with an inscription in Syria, which talked about a war. A Syrian king has written about the war. This was in 1993, they found the rock, and in which are, there was a mention about a battle for Dan, and in it was written that we fought with the house of David, and there were names of Syrian kings, which Bible corroborates. So amazingly, even today, you can see that there are certain things in the Bible which can be historically corroborated, which can withstand the survey of the archaeologists. Some people say, let's not look at that. Let's just look at the promise that God gave to the land of Israel, to the Israelites there. He said, I will scatter you and I will bring you back. Is he not doing it? Is that not proof enough that we should believe in the Bible? Let's look at some of those verses. You know, very quickly I will read these verses. Leviticus 26, 33. It says, I will scatter you among the nations and will draw out my sword and pursue you. Your land will be laid waste and your cities will lie in ruins. And when did this happen? 
Several years ago, when Nebuchadnezzar attacks, Jehoshaphat attacks, Israel and Israel becomes nothing. And you see that. And Ezekiel 36, 19, it says, I dispersed them among the nations, and they were scattered through the countries. I judged them according to their conduct and their nations. We see Daniel and his people, be friends, being taken away. We see Ezra working somewhere else, Nehemiah working somewhere else, all away from their own land. Everybody trying to make an attempt to get back to it. But because that's what God promises. If you see Deuteronomy 30, 4 and 5, even if you have been banished to the most distant land under the heavens, from there the Lord your God will gather you and bring you back. He will bring you to the land that belonged to your ancestors and you will take possession of it. He will make you more prosperous and numerous than your ancestors. In other words, Ezekiel 36, 24, for I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. Let's look at one more. Jeremiah 31, 1, 10. Hear the word of the Lord, you nations. Proclaim it in distant coastlands. He who scattered Israel will gather them and will watch over his flock like a shepherd. In November 1947, when the United Nations General Assembly decided that Israel will become a state and made a partition plan. And in 1948, when David ben Gurion announced the establishment of the statehood of Israel, we see the Aliyah, or the people coming from different parts, Jews from all over the world coming together. And if you see history itself, several phases of Aliyah where people come to their promised land, or to the place to which God said he will gather them again, that should be proof enough for us to believe that historically we can corroborate what the Bible says. A few years ago, I had the joy of being in Jordan, and I remember we had a very enthusiastic guide who showed us the road and said, you know, this road is mentioned in the Bible. I said, yeah, because when Moses, because we, we were near Petra, and some of you who have been there would know that Petra was once called Edom, E-D-O-M, which is there in the Bible. He says, when Moses and his people came here, they asked the king of Edom, can we pass here? We will only go on this road. Well, I thought some of these guides can really go overboard. So I went to the hotel, took up my Bible, and went there. And you read this Numbers 20, 14 to 17. Numbers 20, 14 to 17. It says, this is what your brother Israel says. You know about all the hardships that... This is where... I'm, I'll just read from the beginning. Moses sent messengers from Kadesh to the king of Edom, saying, this is what your brother Israel says. You know about our, all the hardships that have come on us. Our ancestors went down to Egypt and we lived there many years. The Egyptians mistreated us and our ancestors. But when we cried out to the Lord, he heard our cry and sent an angel and brought us out of Egypt. Now we are here at Kadesh, a town at the edge of your territory. Please let us pass through your country. We will not go through any field or vineyard or drink water from any well. We will travel along the king's highway and not turn to the right or to the left until we have passed through your territory. If ever you go to Jordan, please see the word king's highway. King's highway, probably the oldest ever highway in the world mentioned very clearly. We see Bible has certain things that you cannot refute. And it will be simply illogical for you to keep arguing against it. You can just deny that it is true. But if you have to really go about arguing whether it, it is really true, then you will be amazed at the beauty of what the Bible says. The one I just mentioned, Josh McDowell, in his book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, writes something very interesting about the scriptures. Because people always talk about how we could have corrupted the scriptures because they were handwritten, copied from one place to another until it came to what we have today. Until Gutenberg invented the printing press, we did not have a way of mass printing books. So it must have been only copied. So obviously there must have been some mistake somewhere. So are we really carrying the Bible that is true? Are we carrying the one that is original? He writes, Josh McDowell, please go and read if you can get all this. He says, there are more than 5,686 known partial or complete Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. Add over 10,000 Latin Vulgate and at least 9,300 other early versions and we have close to, if not more than, 25,000 manuscript copies of portions of the New Testament in existence today. No other document of antiquity even begins to approach such numbers or attestation. In comparison, 
Homer's Iliad is second with only 643 manuscripts which still survive. Look at 643 manuscripts of Homer's Iliad and look at 25,000 plus manuscripts of the New Testament that are available. That tells us, based on these manuscripts, upon the writings of the early Christians who frequently quoted the scripture, there is overwhelming evidence that the New Testament was translated from accurate representation of the original texts. Thus, there is no reason to assume that our modern Bible is full of clerical mistakes for a detailed discussion of the biblical historical authenticity. See, you see, it says that the Jews followed strict rules and procedures when copying their scripture. As a result, the copied manuscripts contain almost no significant variation from the original texts. This high degree of accuracy was confirmed after the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947. The Dead Sea Scrolls contained manuscripts nearly thousand years older than the oldest Old Testament manuscript possessed at that time. However, almost no variation was found between the earlier and the later manuscripts. For example, the book of Isaiah proved to be word to word identical with our standard Hebrew Bible and it was 95% accurate. The 5% of variation consisted chiefly of obvious slips of pens and variations in spellings. We have a wonderful word. And it is unfortunate that we do not want to investigate into why this is true. Why this has withstood the test of time. You can give Booker Prizes, Pulitzer Prizes, Nobel Prizes of literature to books. But they come, they go. But this one goes on and on. Because we know that this can withstand historical tests. This can, which is why one of the greatest archaeologists called William Ramsey. William Mitchell Ramsey. You can Google him when you go back home. Uh, he had doubts about the New Testament. And one of his main passions was to try to prove the New Testament wrong. The names, the places mentioned in the book of Acts and in all those places may be wrong. So he went to Asia Minor, spent nearly 20 to 30 years digging up the entire place, finding out, reading ancient manuscripts and trying to compare them and find out. And finally, he became a Christian. And he writes, I want to read this one line. He says, I set out to look for truth on the borderland where Greece and Asia met and found it there in the book of Acts. You may press the words of Luke in a degree beyond any other historian's and they stand the keenest scrutiny and the hardest treatment. William Mitchell Ramsey. He was the professor of the classical art and architecture of Oxford. And he is the man who says that Luke was a great historian. Now I believe it. When he wrote the book of Acts, he has used what was a good way of a historian's style. And in fact, his, this particular archaeologist I'm talking about, did such good job that he was knighted for it, Sir William Mitchell Ramsey. And lastly, the relevance to historical transformation. The Bible, the way it changed people is enough for us to understand the greatness of this word of God. How it had changed people who we thought would never change. There was somebody in, Bible called, uh, in India called Sadhu Sundar Singh who tore up the Bible. But he became one of the greatest preachers later on. But I would like to specifically talk about another person from the same land of Sadhu Sundar Singh called Bhakt Singh. And some of you who are familiar with the word Singh from India would know that they are from Punjab. This man Bhakt Singh was from Punjab. He went to London to study in the 1920s. He had to convince his parents a lot. Because at that time traveling so far to study was not for the ordinary. But you know that People like Mahatma Gandhi and all who had the means to go to London to study were able to go. And Bhakti Singh went to London to study mechanical engineering. And there, while he was a student, but before he went, he told his parents, he once tore the Bible, he also, saying that these Britishers who've come and who are teaching us this Christianity know nothing about my country. And he was so angry, but when he was there, he had to go to Canada for a short trip. And he was on the ship, and on the ship, there was an opportunity to listen to the word of God because there was a Sunday service happening in the dining car or dining hall of that ship. I want to read out exact words of what Bhakti Singh had written. I went and occupied one of the back seats. When they all stood up to sing hymns, I stood up too. 
When they sat down, I sat down too. And when the preacher began to preach, I went to sleep. I did not want to listen. When the sermon was over, they all knelt down to pray. I was the only person not kneeling. These people do not know anything about my religion. They have exploited my country. And I have seen them eating and drinking. What do they know? After all, my religion is the best religion. So my national, intellectual and religious pride prevented me from kneeling and I wanted to go out. But I found that one man was kneeling to my right and another was kneeling to my left and I said it would not be right for me to cross. Then I began to say, I have been to Mohammedan mosques and Hindu temples. I have taken off my shoes. I washed my feet to show some respect to those places. So I must honor this place too out of courtesy. So I knelt down. Please note that this was the first time I was attending a Christian service and I had never read the Bible before nor had anyone spoken to me about salvation. When I knelt down, I felt a sudden change come over me. My whole body was trembling. I could feel some strange divine power entering into me and lifting me up. The first change that I noticed in me was a great joy, a strange joy that flooded my soul. Now to take you further, after a few days, he was completely transformed in that particular journey. He went to Canada. He stayed with somebody. On 14th of December, he, I'm reading his words again. I said to a friend of mine, could you lend me a Bible? He looked very much surprised and said, you, a Hindu and an Indian, you want to read the Bible? I have heard the Hindus do not read the Bible. I said, you are right. These very hands had once torn the Bible. But these very lips have blasphemed against Christ. But for the last 18 months, I have great love for the Lord Jesus. I love these very names. Somehow, I don't know which sounds so sweet to me. But do not know yet anything about his life or teaching. My friend put his hand into his pocket and gave me a pocket New Testament. I brought it to my room and began to read from the Gospel of St. Matthew. I kept on reading till 3 in the morning. As I became engrossed in the Word of God, in the morning, I found the whole ground covered with snow and it remained all day and I remained in the bed reading the book. It goes on to say after a few days for Christmas because 14th December, he writes every date. For Christmas, somebody said, what do you want me to give? He said, give me a Bible. He took the Bible and he says, on the 22nd of February, 1930. Now look at Christmas, 22nd of February, 1930, I finished the whole book. In the meantime, I had also read the New Testament several times. Then I started reading the Bible a second and third time. I gave up reading magazines, newspapers and novels. I have accepted the Bible as the word of God from the first verse of Genesis to the last word of Revelation. And no doubt has ever entered into my mind regarding any verse. Those of you from India would know what an amazing ministry Bhakt Singh did. And for the information of those who don't know him, I would like to read these words by Dr. J. Edwin Orr, British church historian. He wrote, Brother Bhakt Singh is an Indian equivalent of the greater Western evangelists, as skillful as Finney and as direct as Moody. He is a first-class Bible teacher of the order of Campbell Morgan and Graham Scroggie. A man who tore up the Bible, began reading the Bible, and reread the Bible so much so that he left everything and became an amazing preacher. Half of India must today owe their lives to the ministry of Bhakt Singh. I'm sure some of you from India would agree with the amount of work that he has done because Bible has that power of transformation. Let me read from Psalms 119-105, which is a familiar verse to all of us. We say that this is a lamp that directs our paths. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. In Jeremiah 23, 9, we say, it is, it is written, Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces? And in Hebrew 4, 12, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. If you go to the next verse, James 1, 23 to 24. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets that he looks like. But whoever looks intently 
into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So the Bible talks about the word of God as different things, a lamp, a sword, a mirror, a rock, fire, milk. You see different solid meat. There are different ways in which the Bible refers to the uh, word of God itself. And we can see that it actually worked. In the life of Bhakti Singh, has it not changed him? Did it not cut like a sword, making him completely transformed? It has the power of transformation, which is why, you know, some people read the Bible. You know, I was reading a very interesting research. PEW, Pew Research, is a very famous research organization. They found out that when they ask some questions from the Bible, the people who claim they are not Christians have read more Bible than the people who claim they are Christians. Which means in order to go against it, they are reading more. They have proved that actually there are more people who do not like the Bible but read it. But there are some people who like the Bible, say they like the Bible, but they don't read it. So it is important for us to know that. But we should not read this for information because D.L. Moody said these words. The Bible was not given for our information. It has been given for our transformation. It has been given for, not for information so that you can see, oh, I know this, I know so much. I know, but it is for the transformation. Rick Warren, the pastor from America, who has written that very famous book, The Purpose Driven Life. In fact, he is one of those probably very, very rare Christian personalities to be on the cover of a Time magazine. And he wrote, the purpose of the Bible is more than just showing us what is wrong with our lives or how we should live. God gave us his word to radically transform our lives. So the Bible's purpose is the transformation of humans. The Bible's purpose, the reason for Bible to exist is so that we can change, so that we can live a life that God wants us to live. Very often, we look so much into the worldly books. We have so much time for so many things of this world, but we do not seem to have enough time to read this. This book that has changed life. This book that can change us. The best book to read is the Bible, they say. So we must relish this bestseller. If you look at some of those people who try to count how many books and how many millions of copies were sold, sometimes they say we are exempting Bible, the Quran, and the little red book of the Mao Zedong, you know, because in China it is said that every adult must own a copy of the little red book of Mao Zedong. If you take away that, you can look at other books. But we know that throughout history, this was among the first books to be printed, and this is among the most books to be printed, most number of languages into which it has been translated, but sadly, many times it just adorns our bookshelves, not our hearts, which is what it is supposed to do, which is what it is supposed to make, transform us. I told you about Richard Dawkins, the man who was against the Bible, who is still against the Bible, and that's why I said he is also considered as a missionary for atheism. This Richard Dawkins, interestingly, wrote an article in The Observer last year. And in The Observer, he writes these words. A native speaker of English who has never read a word of the King James Bible is verging on a barbarian. Richard Dawkins says that if you are a native English speaker and if you have not read the King James Version, you are almost a barbarian. <laughs> A man who doesn't like the Bible, who says it's not, but he wants you to read the Bible. In fact, he supported the distribution of Bibles to the schools. In fact, he wrote, there's something uh, very interesting, he says, in the week of the 2011 census, 2011 census, my UK foundation commissioned Ipsos to poll those who had ticked the Christian box. In the, in the census, if you click the Christian, they went and searched. Among other things, we asked them to identify the first book of the New Testament. And from a choice of Matthew, Genesis, Acts of Apostles, Psalms, I don't, don't know and prefer not to say. So they gave six options and told, please tell us which is the first book of the Bible. Out of 100, he says, 35% chose Matthew. 35% only chose that the first book of the Bible was Matthew. 39 chose don't know. And 1% mysteriously chose prefer not to say. Well, we don't know why they didn't want to say. But anyway, what he says is, 
These figures, I repeat, do not refer to the British people at large, but only those who said they were Christians, which shows the sad truth of how much we know about the living word, how much we know about this so that we can fulfill the Lord's commission. If we really think that we can go about fulfilling the Lord's commission, it is important that we read this word, which is the most essential thing. Why can't we spend time on this real bestseller, relishing what it has got? You get your children a lot of things, great DVDs to teach, great books to buy, but why not a very good Bible that they can actually refer to? How many of us can really claim, yes, there is one Bible in which each one of our, in our family will always go to tick mark, write, make notes on this. Yes, somebody said, if your Bible looks very used, then that means you are really going the right way. Lastly, uh, I'll just read these two verses and then end. Joshua 1.8 says, keep this Bible of the law, uh, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it then you will be prosperous and successful. In Psalm 1910, they are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. David writes that the word of God is like honey, so sweet. But this can be only known if we read and taste it. If we read about it, that may not help us much. If we read it, that's what's going to help us. And long time ago, maybe he was talking about the Pentateuch or the five books, when Joshua was told that this book of the law should not leave. It should be always on your lips and it will make you prosperous. We have such a beautiful promise from the word of God. So why don't we use this? Because today, a character called Harry Potter can make its creator the first billionaire to become from the books. Today, we see a series of books on vampires and romances becoming big hits and people writing and buying. Today, we see some shady book with 50 different types of gray become Amazon, bestseller on Amazon. Today, we see people dying to get hold of a copy of Inferno of Dan Brown so that we want to know what's happened in this. What will Robert Langdon do? We are curious about so many things in this world. I can spend hours together reading the newspaper from cover to cover. I can spend hours together watching TV news after news, analysis after analysis. I can spend hours together sitting on the Facebook looking at this. But how much time am I spending on the word of God? How much time am I spending really looking into what we need to? I think, dear friends, it's time we go back to the essence of our lives. Some of us may have read it before, but you think we know it all now. But I think this is a Bible which needs to be gone back to again and again. The best book to read is the Bible. And let's keep it that way. Let's pray. Almighty God, our loving and living Father, we want to thank you once again, Lord, for what a great book that you've given to us. Enable us, O oh Lord, so that we might go to this regularly, every day, and read and know you more. Help us to draw more closer to you so that, Lord, we can live lives that are worthy of you. Enable us, O oh Lord, so that we can live in this world lives that can bring glory and honor to your name and that would make many people be introduced to your saving grace. Thank you for this time, O oh Lord.